Amen. So we're in John chapter 2 for the third week. We're going to finish that chapter up this evening. We're going to look at this story um, towards the end of John chapter 2. So, of course, in John chapter 2, we looked at the first miracle um, of Jesus. We looked at the, the water to wine uh, miracle where Jesus kind of officially starts his ministry. He starts his first miracles there. Then we looked um, at the story, um, you know, just of, of what, how people misuse um, that story in the Bible and can teach that Jesus, you know, was, a, was, a, was serving alcohol and getting people drunker. So we disproved that from the Bible. Then we looked at Jesus, you know, driving out the people selling in church. We're going to pick up in um, John chapter 2 and verse number 18 um, this evening and look at this last um, little story that happens here, this last little, um, you know, um, historical event that happens, I guess. I, I don't want to say stories. These are you know, this is the Bible telling us um, the eyewitness accounts here. Look at verse number 18 where the Bible says, Then answers the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing, thou that, doest, seeing that thou doest these things? So the Jews, again, you know, um, Jesus rebukes them later for this, but they're asking for a sign. They're asking for a sign as if these miracles um, are not enough. You know, then they're asking for a sign after he drives everybody out of the, the temple. He's kind of saying, they're kind of saying, um, you know, what authority do you do this with? You know, he comes in there and he, he throws all these tables over and whips all these people out of the temple. They're saying by what, you know, basically saying what authority do you do this by? Jesus answered in verse 19 and said unto them, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? So, of course, um, they thought that he was literally talking about um, Zerubbabel's temple or the second temple. Remember, at this time, um, the uh, Babylonians, you know, had already torn down um, Solomon's temple some 400 um, years earlier. And then, of course, the story of, if you remember the book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah, is when the people came back from the Babylonian captivity. And in the book of Ezra... Um, that's when Zerubbabel begins to build the temple at the beginning of the book of Ezra. And, you know, you say, why did it take 46 years? Well, there was a lot of, um, you'd have to read those books. There's a lot of strife and there's a lot of people stopping um, the work of that temple. But what we're looking at, what we're dealing with um, in John chapter 2 is the second temple. Now, the second temple is sometimes um, called, like historically, it's called Herod's temple. Um, and it's because Herod kind of did a restoration project. Um, on the second temple. But all that to be said, even if you hear people say Herod's temple, they're talking about the second temple that Zerubbabel built after the, the Babylonian captivity was over and the Jews were allowed to go back to, the children of Israel were allowed to go back to the promised land and they rebuilt that temple. So they thought that Jesus was talking literally about tearing down the temple and rebuilding it in three days. All right, but of course, um, in 20, verse 21, the Bible says, but he spake of the temple of his body. All right, when therefore he was risen from the dead. And verse 22 is really kind of a cool verse because it kind of gives us a future, um, a future event here. It tells us that when Jesus was raised from the dead, because keep in mind, Jesus has just started his three and a half year ministry in John chapter 2. But then verse 22 jumps ahead to what the disciples did after Jesus was actually raised from the dead three and a half years later. It says, when, therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they understood at that point. So basically what the Bible is telling us here is nobody really understood what Jesus was talking about when he spoke of the temple of his body. You know that verse 21 is the narrator talking. You know, that's the Holy, Holy Spirit um, talking to us there. You know, that's not something that, they knew at the time, including the disciples, okay? So it's always, uh, you know, it's always interesting. This is just a side note. When you're reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament, it's, it's, it's important to point out when the narrator of the Bible is talking because a lot of times people are very confused about things in the Bible, especially the Old Testament. I get this question um, over the years. I've gotten this question quite a few times from people. People. Just like, how could these horrible things have happened? And how could these people do these horrible things? And how could this be in the Bible? How could these men have done? It's, 
those are just historical things that happened. That doesn't mean that, you know, everything that's written in the Bible is, you know, what God wanted men to do. I mean, that, that's not the way the Bible is written. But it is important to know, you know, when the, the word of the Lord said or the narrator is speaking, you know, that is um, the, the truth of God right there. All right. I mean, obviously, the whole Bible is true, but much of the Bible is simply um, historical, what men actually did. And then, of course, the reason the Bible puts that in there is so we see the consequences that came upon um, those men, those nations, all right? So we don't repeat those things, right? <laughs> That's the idea. But then nobody knows the Bible, so what's the point, all right? Okay, so verse 22 is kind of a neat verse where they just kind of tells you the disciples, they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about until he rose from the dead. Look at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So I'm going to kind of pause right there and kind of go back to this idea in verse 21 of Jesus speaking about the temple of his body. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Actually, turn to Luke chapter 21 real quickly. Because Jesus, they're, they're, thinking, that, they're thinking that Jesus actually did prophesy that he was going to tear the temple down. But the irony of that is that Jesus actually does that later. All right, so turn to Luke chapter 21 and look at verse number 6. So that's not what Jesus was doing here. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. But Jesus does do that in verse number, verse number, um, verse number 5 and 6 of Luke chapter 21 where the Bible says, And some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. He said, and as some spake. So they were talking about the physical temple, how it was adorned with all these wonderful things. And if you have a red letter Bible, verse 6 is Jesus speaking, where it says, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, of course, Jesus is prophesying that the temple, this second temple, Jerubbabel's temple, Herod's temple, whatever you want to call it, will be destroyed. And, of course, we know that that historical event did happen in 70 A.D. There was this revolt, and the Romans were, I mean, the political situation was just the Romans were just, they had just had it. They had just had it with um, the Jews. They had had it with all the trouble that they were causing. And unfortunately, that's sort of when, if you read historical, um, just secular history, that is historically when, you know, the persecution of the Christians really shifted from the Jews to the Romans at that point. Because, I mean, and maybe this is my opinion here, but the Jews really, or the Romans really kind of lumped the Christians in with the Jews. They looked at them as a, and you know, the book of Acts tells us that, that um, the Romans, you know, they look at them as a sect. Uh, of the Jews, kind of like a, you know, some offshoot denomination of the Jews, which is exactly what it wasn't, all right? And, you know, a lot of people still teach that today, actually, that, you know, we're all, it's Judeo-Christian, and, like, nothing can be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, when you go out soul winning, and I've, I've mentioned this before, not to derail the sermon, but when you go out soul winning, and you go out and you find people of different religions, you will find that the people that believe the worst things about Jesus are actually the Jews, it's that Jewish religion that believes that Jesus is in hell, he's being punished, you know, all these different things, just believe terrible things about Jesus. And that's why the, the people that follow the Jewish religion even today are very difficult to get saved. And, you know, if you're a soul winner, you will, you know, I'm sure you will agree that that's been your experience as well. I'm not saying it's easy to get Muslims saved. I'm not saying it's easy um, to get, you know, other people of other religions saved, but you will have a much easier time because they believe at least good things about Jesus, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. All right, so Jesus actually did prophesy the destruction of the temple. All right, now here's an interesting thing. I think also that this is, you know, proof right here that Jesus prophesying in Luke chapter 21 and verse number 6, prophesying the destruction of the temple, this is proof that the New Testament that we have in front of us was finished before 70 AD. So a lot of people are like, oh, you know, when was the New Testament? You know, all these secular scientists or archaeologists or whatever have all these ideas that, 
you know, the New Testament wasn't finished until 100 AD and thus, you know, what they're doing is they're trying to throw shade on the Bible. They're trying to sh throw shade on these texts to say, oh, you know, they must have misremembered if they wrote it down 40 years later, right? But the, the New Testament was finished almost right away because if the temple was destroyed, certainly the Holy Spirit would have had Paul or the other writers of the New Testament mention that event because Jesus prophesied it. And the Bible is constantly talking about all the different prophecies. And whenever we come across one in the, in the Gospel of John, I'm going to point that out to you, go back to the Old Testament and show you that, the prophecy that was fulfilled. And that would have been one that was fulfilled, so the Bible certainly would have mentioned it. So that's how we know that the Bible was, you know, you know Genesis to Revelation was finished well before 70 AD. All right, well before 70 AD. All right, now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to explore this idea where Jesus says in verse number 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. When he said, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was literally talking about himself. He was talking about his physical body, which is interesting because that reflects directly upon us as believers in Christ. The Bible says that your body is a temple. So it matches what Jesus says in John chapter 2. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19. The Bible says what? Know ye not, and you're going to keep your place in 1 Corinthians 6, even when we flip to other chapters, because I'm going to, I'm going to go to some verses before this as well. But the Bible says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. So first of all, what happened when you were saved? When you were saved, as Ephesians chapter 1 says, when you were saved, you were literally sealed by the Holy Spirit. That was the mechanics of it. You know, God actually gave you an earnest, the Bible says, which was the, the Holy Spirit was the earnest of your inheritance, meaning God gave you a down payment of the Holy Spirit. Look, that actually happened to you when you got saved. You got that Holy Spirit put in you, and it, it seals you. All right. So the, the Bible is saying in 1 Corinthians 6 that your body is literally the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Why? So the Bible here is saying this is a, a pretty important verse for a lot of the things that we're interested in this church right here. Okay. It says that our body is a temple, meaning it's a, it is a building. It houses. It is a, it is a, is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. That's a dwelling place of God, which is in us. And the Bible says we do not belong to ourselves. You're like, what? The Bible says that you, your body does not belong to you. Why? And it's talking to, to the Corinthian church. It is talking to saved people here. That is something to, to understand here. And this is, look, this was super valid in the last couple of years. This was super important in the last two or three years, especially with some of the things that went on in this country. These verses right here talking about how our bodies are a dwelling place for the Holy Ghost and our bodies are not ours. Well, whose are they then? Look at the next verse. For ye are bought with a price. What was that price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So my body is God's because what? Because he bought it. He paid for it. With what? With the blood of Jesus Christ. So our body is a temple, a dwelling place of the Holy Ghost, and it is not mine. It is not mine because the Lord Jesus Christ bought and paid for it with his own blood. That is super important right there. As a matter of fact, this, our, this, this doctrine right here was the doctrine that you know, people put forth to tell people you couldn't make them do medical things to themselves and take shots that they didn't want to take. One of the ironies about this, and if you had a religious exemption that you had to use at work or whatever, this was the core if I wrote it. Right here, that our bodies are not our own. They were paid for by the blood of Christ, and they house the Holy Spirit. So we are not to just go and just do whatever we want to our bodies. You know, just go and just, but see, here's the irony. Here's the irony for once. And it usually doesn't work this way, but the irony of the last couple of years with the COVID stuff is, is that it was the, the non-religious people that had the most trouble. 
Even though they were being logical, they were being reasonable, reasonable saying, um, I don't think that something that's not really been tested and it was really rushed to market and I don't really need it because I'm, prob I'm, I'm, I'm pretty healthy, you know. It was them that had trouble because they had no, you know, the, the actual law in this country, you know, the Civil Rights Act, it protects religious belief, not logical belief. <laughs> so it was this doctrine that was the core if you had a, you know, a, a religious exemption that you, you needed to use there, all right? And actually, when it comes to every single rights argument, this really is the doctrine right here. Really that no, no secular leader can just go and tell you to do something to yourself or with yourself or have you go do something immoral. I mean, the Bible is literally saying here that no, you know, God owns your body. And this fits perfectly with Romans 13, where, you know, we always have to obey the higher powers, meaning somebody can't tell me to do something immoral because I obey the higher powers. Why? Because my body's not my own. Because why? Because God bought it with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And my body literally, not only did God buy my body with the blood of Christ, but my body literally houses God. It literally is used as a vessel to carry around the Holy Spirit. So yeah, nobody can tell me to do something immoral with my body. But the problem is well, people don't need to be told to do things immoral with their body. They just do it anyway. But we should start to think about things a little bit different when we think about our bodies actually being a temple of the Holy Ghost. I mean, you should think about sin a little bit differently when you think about your body in that sense. That your body is literally a temple, a tabernacle, a tent, a building, a vessel that is carrying around the Holy Ghost. That's why I turn to James chapter 1. You're going to keep your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but turn to James chapter 1. That's why, and the irony, so we're going to talk about your physical body a little bit tonight. All right, we're going to talk about your physical body. That's why, you know... It's ironic, and somebody brought this up, soul winning, but look, sin destroys your physical body. Did you know that? Sin will destroy your physical, physical body, and it's, and it's ironic because your senses, you know, when you think about your senses, you know, smell, touch, you know, um, taste, all these different things. Um, we were out soul winning today, and, and like some old, old Volkswagen drove by, like a 1970s Volkswagen where you could, you know, that, that old car exhaust, I mean, I just love it. That, that old, old 60s and 70s cars where you got that, that unburnt gasoline vapor. I mean, it, it's just like if anything smells better than that, I've not smelled it. It's just like the best ever. You know, it just, I don't know if it's just, it brings back, you know, nostalgia or something. But it just, and, and even Jacob, he's never, he, he, I told him, I said, it smells good, doesn't it? He said, yeah. And I said, anything that smells good is bad for you. So it's ironic because anything... You know, our body, our senses are kind of trying to destroy, our body's trying to destroy itself, if you look at it that way. Anything that, you know, tastes good or smells good or all these different things. I mean, there was stupid idiots in the high school that I was in that would huff gasoline. They would, like, you know, sniff gasoline to try to, you know, get a buzz or something. I don't know what they were doing, but, like, it's really bad for you. Like, I'm sure they were, like, their brain is probably gone at this point. But I mean, you know, gasoline, everyone's like, oh, it smells good, you know. But your body's kind of in that, it's kind of leading you down the wrong path. This is the flesh that the Bible talks about. You know, this is the flesh. Look at James chapter 1, verse 15. This is that lust, you know, those senses that say, oh, that's good, I like that. Ice cream, good. Hey, ice cream, okay. Ice cream four times a day, not okay, right? The Bible says this, says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, we teach this all the time out soul winning, that, you know, the wages of sin is death, and then we talk about the second death and the spiritual death. But the truth of the matter is, there's a physical death, too. There's a physical death, too. And sin will destroy you physically. And that's actually the context, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that's actually the context of what... Paul is talking about when he says your, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 18. Go back a couple verses and look at verse 18. He was, he's actually talking about the entire context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 
is the idea of your body belonging to God, but he's talking about it in the specific context of the sin of fornication. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. This is literally saying right here, I mean, this is, this is a super important verse right here because fornication, and, and it's not just in the United States today, fornication throughout history has been one of the first sins that is just widely accepted in a society that is turning its back on God. It's one of the first things that people just, you know, run to, and I'll show you a couple examples of it in the Old Testament, but it's talking about fornication destroying your physical body. Look at verse 15. Here's another thing to, to realize about your actual body, and he's, talk, he's teaching this as well. So your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, but your body also has something to do with Christ as well. It's not just that it was bought by Christ, purchased with Christ's blood, but in verse 15 it says, Know ye not that our bodies, your bodies, are the members of Christ. Shall I then, again, he's talking about the context of fornication, shall I then take the members of Christ? When he says members, he's not talking about like we all signed a, a book and we're all members of a club. He's talking about members like arms and legs and, and he's talking about appendages. He's saying your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. He's saying you are all, like, so this church right here, we are all, that's what we're, we're talking about when we say we are the body of Christ. Why? Because we are all appendages of Christ here. So he's saying should someone that is in the body of Christ, that is an arm of Christ, a leg of Christ, a foot of Christ, should, should they be a, a, a harlot? Should they be in fornication? Should they be in, in filth? He's saying no. But the Bible here is telling, uh, is telling you that you know, your body is a member of this body of Christ. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Paul is trying to convince you, like, hey, be clean. Be healthy. Don't destroy this thing that is supposed to be good. That's what he is teaching here. I mean, look, I, I won't even get into all the stats that I've read in the past, but, I mean, literally, like, fornication literally will destroy you. It will kill you. It will kill you. It will make you not be able to have children anymore. It's something like, um, the last time I looked at it, it's something like one in three people in the United States has a, has a disease, like a, a tr an STI or whatever they call them, you know, from fornication. I mean, it's, you know, it's literally disgusting. There's like 110 million Americans. I mean, if you look at, you know, how many Americans are children, <laughs> And how many Americans are older or whatever? It's basically people like in fornication, you know, basically they're, they just have STDs. That's just the way it is. You're like, oh, well, it's just normal and it's accepted. But why, though? It doesn't even make logical sense that it would be, you know, just openly accepted. So the Bible's saying flee, run from it. Get away from it as fast as you can. Teach it to your children as well. That's why it's such a big deal um, for that to be in the church, and it's one of the things that will literally get someone kicked out of church. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Fornication is literally, not to go off on fornication, but fornication is so bad, it is so bad that it is literally, it made the short list in Acts chapter 15 of the things that they decided to tell the Gentiles. They're like, okay, you know, everyone's out there preaching to the Gentiles that they need to get circumcised to be saved. There was this big conference in Jerusalem, and they decided, okay, we've got this big problem. You know, everyone, all the, all the Jews that got saved are freaking out that all these Gentiles are now in the church, and they got saved too. You got all these saved people. They have nothing in common. Their cultures are completely different. And so the, some of the saved people try telling these people just to, you know, they try to control them, right? Just like what happens today. So they change their doctrine. No, you have to be circumcised. You have to do this. You have to do that. The problem is they tied it to salvation. So finally, James just comes out and says, hey, let's just tell them to do these couple things. And that will fix the problem. Nothing to do with salvation. Just tell them to get these things right. Look what one of them was. Look at Acts 15, 20. But we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols. So let's get rid of the idolatry. That's not going to work in church. And from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Actually, you turn to Numbers chapter 25. I'll just read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 8. 
Fornication is so bad, it, it, but it's, it's not just today. It's not just America today. It's any society that just turns from God immediately goes into this, immediately accepts this and just, you know, accepts it as normal and something that's okay. But it's not something, just because you're saved, it is not something that God is just going to let go. And that's why it's preached so hard against from, you know, in any church that is, that is reading and preaching the Bible. Is preached very hard against. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Actually, you're in Numbers chapter 25. I'm going to read for you 1 Corinthians 10, 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 20 and 3, or 3 and 20,000. It's talking about Numbers chapter 25 where the Bible says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Remember, this is the story of Balaam and Balak, where Balaam, you know, wants the money so bad, but God won't let him curse Israel. So basically, Balaam just, he, he doesn't curse Israel, but he goes to Balak. He wants the money from Balak so badly that he goes to Balak and he says, Hey, you know what? Just live amongst them. Just, just make it so they don't separate from you. Just be friendly with them. And look what happens. They, they start committing fornication with them. And then they, they started sacrificing to their gods. And then in, the, in verse number 9, God sends a plague. God sends a plague to basically punish the children of Israel. And it says, and they that died in the plague were 20 and 4 so God judges fornication even amongst the saved. Even amongst his own people, God will judge fornication. And I've mentioned this before. I'll just mention it real quickly. This is one of, like, the big Bible contradictions that people think, like, oh, the Bible's wrong. They, they made a mistake. They put a three when there was supposed to be a four and all this because 1 Corinthians 10, 8 says they, they died in the plague three and 20,000, so that would be 23,000. And then in Numbers chapter 25, verse 9, it says those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. But it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, it says those that fell in one day was 20 and 3,000. So obviously, you know, a thousand more died later. I mean, man, solved, solved that mystery. That was difficult. I mean, that's, that's how all Bible contradictions are. It's just something silly where somebody's read one page in the Bible for five minutes in their life, and they're like, got it, figured it out, right? All right, turn to Proverbs chapter 23. So we're back to this idea that sin, like, destroys you physically. So the idea... The example in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 was fornication. And that's a big one because it's, it's talking about fornication is literally um, just a sin against your own body. So like, yes, you know, your body's telling you to do it and your, your flesh says that you want to do that and that it's good, but it's literally destroying yourself. All right. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. Another uh, a common sin that is actually tied to fornication that destroys your body is alcohol, drugs, and just drunkenness in general. Just not being sober in general. Look at verse 23 or verse 29 of Proverbs 23. The Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions? And then look at this, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, meaning you're going to be, your physical body is going to be wounded, who hath redness of eyes, and said, They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. When it giveth this color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Look at verse 33. It says, thine eyes, shall, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So this is literally saying that if you, know, if you go into this drunkenness, you're going to be wounded without cause. You're going to get in fights, all these different things. I mean, this is bar fights right here, right? I mean, you know, I mean, do, do, is, are, are men, are a group of young men more or less likely to fight if they're all drunk? I mean, this is what this is talking about. It's just a biblical truth right here. But then it's saying they're going to go into fornication too. It says their eyes will behold strange women. Strange women means women they don't know. Women that they normally wouldn't be around. You know, women that are just like, they're unknown. They're from, they're, they're Moabites. Yea, that, then verse 34 is more physical harm. Yea, thou shalt be as thou that liest down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. You wouldn't be in these places because you would be worried about your physical security. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When, I shall, when shall I awake? I shall seek it again. 
So it's talking about drunkenness and not being sober actually tied to fornication, filth, and just generally, look, generally alcohol and drugs, I mean, there's plenty of examples around this, uh, around, around the cities for, for us to see this. It destroys your physical health. It destroys your body. It destroys, I can't tell you how many people I've met in my life that literally, I mean, people that are, you would think are normal people, that they're, they go to work every day, that, that they're literally, they have high blood pressure and they have, like they're pre-diabetic and they have all these health problems and, they're and they, they drink alcohol all the time. And their doctor like doesn't even ask. They're just like, they're on all these medications for all these problems. This is not, you know, the drug addict in the alley. This is just like a normal person that's just like having high blood pressure, you know, pre-diabetic, all kinds of other health problems. Just from what? From drinking. From drinking, and that, that's what leads to it. And then they live with hypertension and high blood pressure for decades, and they get what? They get heart disease. And heart disease kills like one in four people in the United States. It's ridiculous. It's like pretty much people that die when they're older of heart attacks, they die of heart disease. It's been going on for years and years and years. So look, it's, it's, it's also, I mean, depression, anxiety, stroke, suicide, it's all due to, you know, alcohol, substance abuse. Pe people doing what? I mean, cirrhosis of the liver. All these things are just people destroying their body through what? Through sin. Their physical body. So sin literally wrecks you physically. That's the first point I want to make. It, it, yes, sin, if you're unsaved, is going to send you to the second death, that spiritual death. But if you're saved, sin can still destroy your physical body. It can destroy your health. The second one is this. When it comes to our physical body, we should make an effort to stay physically strong. You say, what do you mean? And this is a huge problem in America today. This is a huge problem in our country and in our culture today. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Our body is a member of the body of Christ. Your physical body is a member of Jesus Christ's body. When you think about it that way, you should, you should try a little harder to make yourself healthy and keep yourself strong. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Let me give you a couple examples of women. Look, this is one of the biggest lies that my generation was taught right here. This idea, this idea that, that physical activity, physical work, going to work and having a job where you actually do something physical is bad. It's a huge lie. This idea that I should pursue uh, a career for 30 years, for 35 years, and have my one goal be to just get to this point where I, where I, I, I cross this finish line and I'm just pursuing this life where I can just flip this switch and it's just like do nothing now, leisure now. It's, it's false. It's false. And I can't tell you as you get older and you see people execute this type of plan. Live a, a maybe they have a physical job, maybe they don't, but then they get across that finish line and they do nothing and they're dead in just a few years. I mean, why is that? Because look, you need to be doing something physical. It's good for you. It keeps you strong. I'm going to prove it to you here. I'm going to give you some examples for women here. You say, women should be strong? Yes, women should be strong. Look at verse uh, 16 of Proverbs 31. The idea that hard work, that actual physical work is bad, is a huge lie. And you know what? It's been sold, it's been sold to my generation heavily. And it's being sold to generations beyond me as well. But it's a lie. You know, they came out, they've come out with studies now that say having a job where you are not physically active, where you're having that desk job, like, man, I got that desk job. I got that job where I sit down. It's killing you faster than if you smoked cigarettes every day. Scientific studies have shown that. You get that desk job, you sit down at that desk, and nothing's killing you faster than sitting at that desk. That's why you're starting to see all the standing desks everywhere. The next one's going to be like standing at a desk kills you too. You're going to figure that one out in a couple of years too. 
Look at Proverbs 31 and verse 16. Look at the virtuous woman here. The Bible says, She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and she strengtheneth her arms. This woman is active. This woman is out there, and she is physically strong because why? Because she's active. She's not just laying around. She's not just laying around not doing anything, you know, watching Oprah or whatever. That was a bad example. Turn to Ruth chapter 2. Turn to Ruth chapter 2. Look at verse 15 of Ruth chapter 2. Ruth is the only, I'm not saying Ruth is the only virtuous woman in the Bible, but she is the only woman in the Bible that is actually called a virtuous woman. Look at Ruth chapter 2 and verse 15. What was Ruth doing? And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned, what's she doing? She's going behind the harvester, and she's trying to provide food for herself and for her mother-in-law here. And so she's going, and she's literally picking up the scraps, the gleanings, from what the harvester's left behind. And Boaz, this nice man, is saying, hey, put some extra stuff on the ground for her. He has respect for her. Why? Look at this. Do you think she went out there and she gleaned for 20 minutes, and then she stopped, and she sat down and just laid in the sun all day? You think Boaz would have said that? No, he saw this example of what she was doing. She's out there, and she's busting her, her you know, you know what, every single day. She's out there, and she's working hard. She's just working hard every single day, and Boaz is like, he sees that and he respects it. She gleaned in the field until even and beat out the hand, beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She went out and she worked from, from morning till night. And then she went and she beat out that she had gleaned. And in verse 11 of, of chapter 3, it says, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do all thee that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Look. How, what, what was virtuous about Ruth? I'm sure a lot of things, but the things that the Bible tells us is that she was very diligent and she was hard working. And she, look, she was physically strong. She was physically strong. How about the men? Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. You look at the example of the mighty men, and I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I mean, you probably can't even, we can't even relate to this. We can't even relate to this. That's why people read this stuff today, and they look at these mighty men, and they look at the things that they did, and they're like, oh, that can't be possible. Yeah, for the average American, it's not possible. Not even close. But look at verse 28. Just a couple examples here. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Takamite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adido, the Enznite. He lift up, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800, whom he slew at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defiled the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel had gone array, away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. So you got one guy that, that goes and kills 800 men in battle. This is a hand-to-hand -hand combat. You got another guy that goes and fights so hard that literally his hand just locks up on the sword and he can't let go of the sword. Look, that's a physical thing that'll happen to you. That used to happen to me in a six-minute wrestling match. And your hand's just like you can't open your hands anymore because you work so hard. But he couldn't open his hand. Like these were obviously extremely physically strong men. Now let's look at men in the United States today. No, this is a real thing here. What I'm about to read you is real. This is going to scare you, okay? This is going to make you want to go on more hikes, I'm telling you. A 2016 study, first of all, and I've mentioned this before, but this is real. This is really happening. Testosterone levels in men in the United States are dropping on average by 1% per year since the 1980s. You're like, what in the world? I used to be confused why that was happening. I'm going to tell you why it's happening tonight. A 2016 study, you say, what effects is that having? It's making men weaker. It's making men experimentally, observably weaker in this country. A 2016 study showed that the average 20 to 34 year old man could apply 98 pounds of force with a right hand grip. This is down from 117 pounds in 1985. 
So over the period of 30 years, men have literally gotten, you know, literally almost 30% weaker. You say, what do you mean weaker emotionally, spirit? No, physically weaker. Like a, a young man, a 19-year-old man from 1985 could whoop the snot out of a 19-year-old man in today. That's what this is saying. They're, they're, why? Because they're weaker. They're less manly. Now turn to Jeremiah 51. Now turn to Jeremiah chapter 51. I love when, like, you know, secular science, like, catches up to the Bible thousands of years later. It's, it's always kind of nice when that happens. Jeremiah 51, verse 30. Jeremiah 51, verse 30, the Bible says this. It says, the mighty man of Babylon. I mean, this is nothing new, what's happening here today. It's nothing new. You know, it may be, you know, have a little bit new of a twist. You know, we probably didn't have Oreo cookies back in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's time. But, you know, look at verse 30. It says, the mighty man of Babylon have forborne to fight. They've remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. I mean, their might hath failed, meaning they're not strong. They're weak. They became as women. What does that mean? I mean, it means they're weak. It means they're weak. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. Now, look, I get that that was judgment in Jeremiah 51 and that it's judgment on the United States. I get that. But what can I do? What can we do to not have this you know, physical judgment happen to us? That's, that's the thing. For five or ten years, I've read this this testosterone dropping thing for years and years and years. I've been reading it for 20 years, and it's confused me. I've been like, why is this happening? Is it something in the water? It probably is something in the water, too. But from the endocrine society, they, and I agree with this 100%, it's exactly what it is. It's the Bible. But it, from the endocrine society, this is what they say. It finds that the drop in testosterone levels over time in, in men in the United States is from a man's behavioral and health changes and not so much by aging. See, it's not about, and that matches exactly what the Bible teaches. Because I'm going to read you some things about some old men in the Bible that show, show us that we don't have to go through this. You know, we don't have to have, you know, this happen. Look, it's, it's lifestyle. It's that sin in people's lives. It's that sin, it's that alcohol. You know, alcohol just, just pumps you full of estrogen, actually. Alcohol destroys testosterone. It's scientifically proven. Yet, what does is, what is Satan, you know, convince everybody today? What does a tough guy do in the United States? He drinks beer and he drinks whiskey and all this kind of stuff. No, it's turning him into a woman. It's making him weak, is what the Bible teaches. It's a sedimentary lifestyle that is making this happen. It's this behavior. It's this, it's, it's this epidemic of obesity and diabetes and depression and just like just low standard food and all of this stuff. I mean, when I say low standard food, I mean Doritos and Oreo cookies and this stuff wasn't around. There was some documentary, I've never seen it, I don't know what it's called and I can't even say I re recommend it, but I've heard people talk about it for a year. You know, I've heard it brought up in conversations about some guy that went around the world studying people that lived over a hundred years old. And like, I don't know if it was tribes or whatever, and I'm not like saying we should all go and live in the jungle somewhere, but he's like, he's looking at these people and like, what it all comes down to and what every diet today has in common is that it's just, you're, you're not supposed to just like fill yourself full of all this processed stuff that never existed before the United States. It's like, we just created all this stuff. You know, I mean, there was no, you know, Moses wasn't popping Oreo cookies in, in the wilderness. You know, I mean, it wasn't even an option back then. I mean, that's why a third of Americans are either diabetic or they're going to have diabetes. A third. So a third of them have STDs. A third of them are, are going to have diabetes. I mean, it, it's a disaster. It's a health disaster. And then you, then you add to this that, oh, yeah, testosterone levels are dropping. Well, of course they are. When you look at the actual things that are actually happening, you're like, of course they are. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Actually, go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look, none of us folks, none of us are guaranteed another day on earth. I, I get that. And we shouldn't be just, you know, the, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, bo the bodily exercise profiteth little. But it doesn't say it profiteth nothing. 
And I get it, you know, none of us are guaranteed another day, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I get all that, but I just don't want to shorten my life here because of sin and, and stupid lust of the flesh. That, that's all I'm trying to get you to see tonight. You know, your body is not yours. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, we shouldn't have unhealthy lifestyles. This body is a gift. You know, this body, everybody's physical body is a gift whether they're saved or not. That's why the guy that says, what's God ever done for me? It's like, well, you're living, you're standing here, breathing here. You know, you're standing here, you know, with, with the breath, with the lungs that God gave you, you know, insulting the Lord to me. Your body is a gift. Every breath is a gift. But your body is corruptible. It's corruptible. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 53. You know, this is talking about the resurrection. This is talking about the resurrection. We're going to get glorified bodies. We're not going to have all these problems. But it says this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall it put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So right now, our bodies are corruptible, meaning what? They can be broken. You know, they can be wrecked. They can be, you, you can break it. That, that's, that's what I, you can corrupt this thing through sin, through your lifestyle. Be a good steward. Be a good steward. If, you know, doing these things, turn to Joshua chapter 14. You know, and look, if, if you have, if you have a, a more sedentary lifestyle job, you need to figure out some other things. You need to figure out how to keep moving in your life. You need to have activities outside of your job. You know, because there is, I mean, frankly, there is a lot of jobs where there's just not a lot of, there's just not a lot of physical activity. And you need to supplement physical activity more than the guy that has the job that is doing physical activity all day long. But he's going to be healthier by default than you are. You have to work harder at supplementing those things. So you would go to your sedimentary job and sit at a desk all day long, and then you will have to go home and you will have to exercise and make sure you have activities that keep you moving and or you are going to suffer. That, that's what the Bible is teaching us here. That's what the Bible is teaching us. You know, and look, a lot of people think that, you know, I'm young, I can get away with doing whatever I want. I'm young, I can eat what I want, I can, I can drink, I'm, I'm 25 years old, I can drink alcohol, I just want to have fun now, you know, no problem. I can't tell you, you know, I'm not old, but I'm old enough to have seen many, many people get old and regret those decisions they made when they were 25, they were 30, and they were 35. I've heard people say to me, I never would have done those things if I'd have known I'd be in this situation now. I should have never drank. I should have never smoked. I should have never lived that type of life. Because, I mean, because there's nothing they can do about it now. Just remember, you will be 80 one day. You know, God willing, you will be 90 one day. Look at Joshua chapter 14. Look at verse number 7. Caleb is a great example for us. Look at Joshua 14 and verse number 7. Caleb says this. He says, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land and brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. We heard a great sermon about wholly following the Lord on Friday night. But Caleb's talking about how him and Joshua were the only ones that, you know, literally just did what they were, just stayed faithful to God. Everybody else just ran away. Look at verse number 9. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. This guy's 85 years old right now. Even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Look at this. As yet I am strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. He's saying, I can still fight. I'm just as strong at 85 as I was when I was 40. 
I bet you this guy wasn't a sluggard. I bet you this guy didn't have a sedimentary lifestyle where he just laid around. I bet you this guy, from the time he was 40 to the time he was 85, he never stopped moving. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, I'll just read it for you. It says, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. You know what that means? He was still strong. Man, that would be nice. I'm sure Moses was blessed, but you know what? I'm sure he was active too. I'm sure he was moving around and he certainly wasn't eating Doritos and Oreos. Because, I mean, sin will destroy your body, folks. Living in an unhealthy lifestyle will destroy your body. The more time you spend in these things, the worse it will be. Another thing is that we need to understand as homeschooling parents that we need to teach this to our children as well. You'll notice a pattern as you get older in your life, and you'll notice a pattern that unhealthy people have unhealthy children. It's almost 100%. If you see somebody that just has a terrible, unhealthy lifestyle, whether that mean, look, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody's you know, uh, weight or anything like that, but I mean, it's just like, if you see people that have just like a problem with you know, how they eat and just their lifestyle and they're very unhealthy people, they will have unhealthy children. Because we need to teach that. We need to teach diet and exercise and that lifestyle as part of homeschooling. It's a, it's a life skill. I mean, taking care of yourself physically is a life skill. You want to be as strong as possible when you're old. I want to be out soul winning like some of the folks in this church. <laughs> that's, that's a goal of, of mine, to be out soul winning you know, when I get older in my life. But it's, it's all about reaping and sowing when it comes to your physical temple. And this is just a personal, you know, it's just, a, it's just an example of that. What you sow today, you'll reap tomorrow. It's, it's Hosea 8. You know, it's just, it's, you, 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 you sow the wind and you're going to reap the whirlwind. That's, that's what happens. You've got to think about tomorrow. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and your body is literally an appendage of Christ's body. When you think about it that way, you know, we should think about how we treat this thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.